the heart wants what the heart wants. What can I tell you? I'm Kristen, also known as Mullenvine, here on my YouTube channel, on Instagram, on Ravelry, and pretty much everywhere else on the interwebs. And as always, I'm so happy that you're taking some time out of your day to chat about all the knitting, all the sewing, all the making, or whatever crafty rabbit hole I happen to be diving down this week. So if you're a new viewer, welcome to the channel, my little spot on the interwebs. And if you are a returning viewer, you might notice something a little different happening in the background. Yes, I, over the past weekend, I reorganized, revamped, redistributed the furniture within my craft room. I gave it a major overhaul and it's making me so happy, you guys. <laughs> I'll chat more about that in the blather segment of, of the episode where I chat about life stuff. Uh, but yeah, I did maneuver things around and my sewing table is no longer behind me. It's in another corner of my craft room. Uh, but right now we have we have a new setup, but uh, more on that later. Uh, but just to clarify any confusion you might have, like what what happened? that's what happened. But anyway, uh, I have a hopefully fun show for you guys. I have some knitting to share with you. I've got some sewing. We have a practical that has come to a close. Uh, the practical was a six, six month long make along where we all joined in and made things for our wardrobe, something that, that goes with our color palette or something that we're going to want to gravitate to on a regular basis. Um, something practical for our everyday wardrobe, so to, so to speak. But uh, I have Lock the Thread chose a winner at random using random.org to win a giveaway prize, and that prize is a skein of my hand dyed yarns, woolen vine yarns, in a colorway of your choosing. So, without further ado, the winner of our practical is, drum roll, number 605, Christy Archer. And congratulations, Christy. She made quite a few projects for this make-along. Uh, so, uh, one was actually of her own design, which I was very impressed. It's a really beautiful sweater, very, very simple color blocking. Welcome to Brooklyn. It was like a two-tone sweater, uh, color blocked, separated by a Latvian braid going across the chest. I thought it was a really clever way to transition between both colors, so congratulations, Christy. So please get in touch with me using the email below and let me know uh, your shipping info and what colorway you would like me to dye and which base. Uh, I will be able to dye that colorway on my footsie base or my nouveau base. So let me know and I will get your prize out to you as soon as I can. And congrats again and thank you so much to everybody who participated. I will of course unlock the thread so you can continue uh, chatting and posting your progress and sharing projects and what have you uh, because I know some of you like to keep the conversation going and I love seeing, I love seeing when make-alongs keep going even though the deadline has reached its 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 end so so to speak um but yes yeah, so that leaves us with one make along currently in place and that is our history mall our history make along and i just started this make along i, I announced it last week and again this is a year-long make along where those of us who are interested in making historical garments uh can join in and 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 do that so same idea as the practical it can be any any project you want, it could be knitting, sewing, weaving, crochet, any craft is welcome as long as it harkens to some other era or time period in history uh, prior to the 1950s, uh, just to keep it historically in the past, so to speak. Um, I figured the 1950s is a good cutoff point because everything after the 1950s I feel is kind of vintage, but not that that's a bad thing, it's just we're trying to keep things antique so to speak. <laughs> I am probably making no sense, but anyway, that is what I settled on, the 1950s. Yes, it can be Edwardian era, it can be Victorian, it can be Regency. You, you can hop to any kind of time period that you want. So uh, I start I opened that thread in the Ravelry group, which is the place to be if you want to join in on these make-alongs, and it's already bustling, <laughs> pun totally intended, uh, with conversation and ideas and projects, and it I'm just so happy that you guys are so excited for this. Um, so yeah, it's where we endeavor to make make historical garments and they don't have to be historically accurate. Um, they can be historically inspired uh, as long as you can, can convince me that it is based on a another time period before the 1950s. 
that was a lot of rambling, but I hope you get the gist of it. Uh, yes, it is going to be a year-long make-along, so from March of 2020 to March of 2021, have fun, have at it, and I'm so excited to see all of your wonderful and amazing projects um, to come. So yeah, and I will talk more about my projects that I have in the works uh, later on in the episode, but I think, I think that is pretty much it for announcements this week. <laughs> First up on the docket is a new cast on because <laughs> I promise guys, the sock mojo is not back. It's not back. This is just a project that I work on while I'm watching TV because I don't have to pay attention to what my hands are doing. I just go on autopilot and before I know it, I have a finished sock. And here we go. Um, some spousal socks may have commenced, <laughs> and yeah, these are actually for Dennis. It's been a while since I knit Dennis a pair of socks, and so uh, I've been wanting to cast on uh, a pair of socks with some hand dyed, some yarn that I dyed, and here we are. Um, yeah, so it, again, this is just a basic, a basic sock, one by one rib, cuff down, fish lips kiss heel, um, out of my hand-dyed yarn, Volan Vine Yarns, in my Manderly colorway, a colorway inspired by the movie, or book, I should say, <laughs> uh, Rebecca, by uh, by Daphne du Maurier, and this is what it looks like up close, and I am so in love with the way this is knitting up. Yes, and again, this is just my basic sock recipe. I'm still using US 1.5, 2.5mm needles. Uh, the only thing that I did differently, uh, when I cast on a pair of socks for myself, I my go-to cast on number is 64, but when I knit a pair of socks for Dennis, I go up to 72 stitches. So um, I feel like that that stitch count usually fits him. And I actually had him try these on, and it so far, so good, even the heel. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I wanna say about this other than, yeah, it's just been my TV knitting, and you know, it is a little bit more slow going because it has a larger st stitch count, so it takes me a little extra time to do each row, but not that not that much. Almost half, pretty much halfway done with the first sock, and so yeah, sock, sock, I don't know. But yeah, anyway, uh, I'm trying to think what else. I think that's all I need to say about these, but yes, spousal socks. A phrase coined by the one and only Tommy of Squirrel Pie Productions and Moonstone Dye Works. She, she's always knitting a pair of spousal socks for her husband. So I, I, I purloined the term from her because I think it's brilliant. Anyway, yeah. Yay, spousal socks. Next up on the needles is still a work in progress and that is my giraffe cowl. <laughs> I'm, I think that might just end up be the, being the name of this pattern once it's done. Um, but yes, this is a pattern in the works of my own design using my hand dyed yarns, woolen vine yarns, uh, in two colorways on my croquet base. Um, and croquet is my new sport weight base. It's 100% superwash blue face luster. So in love with the way it's knitting up. It definitely has that toothiness that blue face luster is known for, meaning, you know, it's not, it's, it's not as soft as merino, so to speak, but it definitely has like a, a durable feel to it. But at the same time, it still has like this softness to it. So yeah, it's like the best of both worlds pretty much. Here is where we are and I'm a little bit more than halfway done with it. I'm aiming for 30 repeats of this um, traditional uh, Scandinavian uh, colorwork motif. And on the other side, it's just all these colorwork diamonds, which I, I really, really love. So the idea is that it's going to wrap around twice around my neck, um, and it's just one big skinny tube that I'm knitting, uh, and yeah, when it's done, it's just going to be grafted together at the other end, and Bob's your uncle. I'm not going to lie, it's a little slow going, uh, just because I haven't really had time to work on it. Um, I've been working on it intermittently while I'm dyeing yarn, in between letting dye set into, into the skeins and what have you, so, you know, like, Add a layer of color, sit and knit on this for five minutes, add another layer of color, sit and knit on this for five minutes, rinse, repeat. So that is the, that is my, that has been my workflow on this. Um, and the other thing is I, the, another reason I'm kind of apprehensive about talking about patterns that are still in the process of being designed is because I start getting a lot of questions from people um, about the pattern even before it's it's been released. And I'm still working some stuff out, so 
please, please be patient. As soon as the pattern is ready to be test knit, to be tech edited, I will of course create a project page for this and let you know all as many details as I possibly can. Um, what I can tell you right now is that it's only going to use one, one skein of each colorway. So um, I'm actually using, again, my, my hand dyed yarn, uh, this brown right here. This brown color right here is dirty on purpose, and then this pink right here is courtesan. Uh, and yeah, I'm only aiming to use one skein of each colorway. So, and that has about 280 something yards in it. I don't have a label right in front of me, but it's ballpark, ballpark 280 80 yards per skein. So you definitely get a, a pretty good mileage out of it. Um, but I'm trying to think what else. Uh, and you can use any needle size. Honestly, it's a cowl. It doesn't have to fit your person. It's just got to fit around your neck. So if you want to go up to a bulky weight yarn or a skinny weight yarn and just knit a teeny tiny long tube, have at it. But um, yeah, I, right now for this, this is, I'm using sport weight yarn on US size, da da da, US size six four millimeter needles. Um, yeah, and I'm using... Ooh, I'm using my Chiaogu Shorties interchangeable needle set. Love these things to bits. Again, not endorsed, just a fan. They are awesome. Highly recommend. Um, yeah, and that's where my my giraffe cowl is at the moment. So no no date as to when I'm going to have it finished and published, but um, I will go ahead and create a project page on Ravelry so you can see what notes I have on it so far. So if you want to gather materials, um, <clears throat> shop my update for the yarn. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so that is where I am with that. The other thing that I pulled out of hibernation for, this has been languishing embarrassingly for, I want to say, six months, I think. I cast it on, oh, I think I cast it on in November, but uh, I finally picked up my Nightingale pullover, uh, my pattern by Nora Gone from Pom Pom Magazine. So it's a it's actually from this magazine, Pom Pom Winter 2018, where Nora Gone, uh, extraordinaire, was the <laughs> guest editor of this issue, and she designed the cover, um, the cover pattern, which is the the Nightingale pullover. And yeah, so. I used the yarn that was required, Quince & Co. Lark, in their Damson colorway, and it is absolutely everything that dreams, my, my dreams, are made of. <laughs> so here's the back. I finished knitting the back piece. It is knit in pieces, so you knit the back, then you knit the front, and then you knit the sleeves, and it all comes together magically somehow. Um, so here's where I am with the front, and of course, when you let these projects languish for so long, you kind of forget <laughs> number one, you, you kind of forget specific details that are kind of important to the construction. So my biggest mistake so far is I knit the ribbing and then I completely forgot to go up a needle size when I got to the cable portion of things. So I continued knitting with US size fours and did not switch to US size sixes. <laughs> so about, I wanna say, where, where these two cables cross over. But I, I figured it's only an inch after the ribbing, it's not gonna matter. So fingers crossed, I think it's gonna be okay. Um, but then I got to this point and then I realized, I you know, it was kind of, you know, laying the back and front pieces together and kind of admiring how lovely they look and how matchy-matchy and then something caught my eye. Once you switch to the larger needles, you're supposed to stop ribbing on either side of the stitch markers. <laughs> and I completely forgot to do that. I just continued in ribbing. So after much swearing and, and humming and hawing, I looked, at, I looked at it and tried, you know, to figure out a workaround because I'm not gonna lie, this is not, it's not hard cabling, it's just you have to pay attention at all times when you're working with cables like these. You can't just let, you just can't go on autopilot, so this was three days worth of work, um, you know, just finding spare time, you know, before and after work, a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, and you know, it was a lot of work. So I really was not psyched about having to rip back all that work just so I could knit stockinette on either side. So, you know, it's really simple what I ended up doing because because it was ribbing and didn't involve cabling, I just dropped down the stitches about 40, 45 rows and then took a crochet hook and crocheted all the way back up again. Um, 
and I did that successfully here. You can see a little bit of laddering happening here, but I think once it's blocked out, you're not even gonna notice it. And even if it is slightly noticeable after I block it, it's just gonna be on the side where my arms are gonna be. It's no one's gonna be like looking like that. And if they are, weirdo. So mischief managed on that side. I just have this side left to do. So it's not, I'm so glad that it was just that that I had to worry about, but so far, so good. Because I think if I had to rip all the way back, I would have to let this languish for like another six months or something, and that would just be sad. Anyway, so glad to be working on this again. I think after knitting the front, the, the back part, I kind of needed a couple of palette cleansers before I tackled knitting the same chart over again, because I don't know, that's how my brain works. And I, I needed a little bit of a break. Um, and unfortunately I let it languish for longer than it should have. But you know, um, in lieu of hosting the History Mall, it kind of got my butt back into gear and inspired me to pick this back up again. So very, 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 very happy that I'm working on it again. So, so I believe that is all the knitting content I have to share with you this week. Uh, I know I have some other projects languishing that need finishing, but the heart wants what the heart wants. What can I tell you? Anyway, I am gonna move along to sewing because I have quite a lot of sewing to share with you this week. So yeah, this is turning into a labor of love, but I am making an Edwardian petticoat <laughs> from a pattern, here we go. Um, yeah, it looks just like, a, it, it pretty, it's pretty much just a white blob right now, but the body is done, the, the drawstring is installed, Placket, and then I'm working on the dust ruffle at the bottom. So uh, this is just the first dust ruffle, and then there's going to be another ruffle that goes over it with lace insertions and pin tucks. So that part I am very, very excited to get to. Um, but yeah, this was, I'm not going to lie, a freaking labor of love to get through. So it was just like a long strip or circle of fabric that I had to. Uh, sew two lines of basting stitches in to gather gather it and then stitch it all around uh, to the actual skirt and yeah it not not complicated at all um just a lot of <laughs> a lot of tedious gathering and gathering fabric does take quite some time i'm not gonna lie about that um and the other thing this fabric is very um like the the raw edges have a tendency to want to come unraveled so yeah, I, you know, have a lot of, for some reason, it's just like very, very stringy right now and I have to go through and unpick, uh, not unpick, but uh, just kind of like de-thread de or de-string, like all these little random loose threads that are popping around. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, uh, it comes to the territory and, you know, I can just pop on some podcasts and get going on that. And the other thing, I am trying to figure out how to finish these raw edges on the inside. I know I can run it through a serger, but I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be historically accurate um, and not do that because I know back in the day they did not have sergers. If any of you <laughs> more experienced historical seamstresses or sewists uh, know what I could do to probably finish these raw edges over here, let me see if that's gonna focus, yeah. Uh, without surging, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, otherwise, I was thinking about getting either some bias tape or um, it's like, I can't think, some kind of uh, ribbon or something, like finishing tape ribbon. I can't remember the exact name of it. Maybe I'll pop it up here if it comes to me later, but um, just kind of go over it and, you know, hand stitch it down. But, you know, worst case scenario, if I can't find anything, I'll probably just surge it. Um, but yeah, because it is a petticoat. This weekend, I will I will tackle the, the second ruffle, uh, which I, again, am very, very excited about. Um, because yeah, I get to do insertion lace, and then I also get to try my hand at pin tuck. So both skills, completely new to, and it'll be so fun to finally tackle those. So last week I had mentioned that I wanted to start sewing the Edwardian coat by Black Snail Patterns. And first I want to say thank you so much to everybody who, uh, <laughs> those of you who got in touch with me about using flannel as a lining. Apparently this is not a good idea um, <laughs> because uh, many of you mentioned that um, more experienced sewers have mentioned that 
the flannel has a tendency to stretch as a lining and it just it's just not overall just not a good idea it kind of like sticks to your fabric and anyway bad idea to use flannel as a lining i want to go with a more slippery fabric so kind of tabling the 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 project at the moment until i get the right materials um however i did want to start getting the pattern pasted together and cut out and then i started reading through the pattern and then it, long story short um i think i'm going to table the project for a little bit until i get the right fabrics for it and i also realized that i needed to get uh horse canvas to uh, add some structure to the the some part of the coat. Anyway, um, I have to read through the pattern again, but it did require horse canvas, which is this right here. I ordered it from Amazon. Um, and yeah, you've probably, if you're, if you're into sewing, you've probably seen this before, but it's used to add structure to garments. Um, I want to say like primarily outer garments, like blazers, coats, jackets, um, and collar stands. And, um, it's called horse canvas because it's, I forget whether it's the warp or the weft, but um, one of them, one of, either the warp or the weft is made of cotton and then the, either the warp or the weft is made of horse hair. So you can kind of see, it's definitely lightweight, but it also, you can tell like when you pad stitch it down to fabric, it'll add it some decent structure. And it was actually pretty timely because I saw that Bernadette Banner posted a video on her YouTube channel with another, she had a guest on there, Barbara, I'm forgetting her name, but she creates these beautiful, beautiful uh, bespoke um, corsets. They're incredible. I'll, you know, I'll link to the video down below, but she gives kind of like a little primer in pad stitching and working with horse canvas. So Again, that was really, really timely and really helpful. So I'm really excited, really, really <laughs> excited to uh, get started working with this. Uh, so yeah, but I have the horse canvas. I just have to procure the right uh, lining for the Edwardian coat by Black Snail Patterns and I can get going. Um, but yes, in the meantime, finishing the Edwardian under things. <sighs> yes, so anyway. Huh. All these, all these new things that I want to tackle. Anyway, as you can see, these projects are very, very slow going, very time consuming and require quite a bit of patience. Something that I am not particularly used to. Um, if you've followed my, my sewing journey, you know that I generally crank out dresses and you know garments in a weekend or a day, what have you. Um, and yeah, this is a total learning curve for me in just learning to be patient and take things slowly. And so it's definitely been a lesson in that. And I'm, I'm learning to appreciate slow fashion. It's just, you know, taking your time, be very, being very mindful. Um, and you know, when you do put that much work into, into a garment, it's, you, I don't know, it's, it makes the finished product that much more special. Um, so yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I'm, again, I'm excited to see where it all goes, what I come, come out with and oh, yes. So that's what's in the works right now. Uh, again, this weekend, I'm going to finish the pet. I'm going to attempt to finish the petticoat, um, and get something started because I, I, I do need something. I do need a little instant gratification in my life just to kind of treat myself, so to speak. So anyway, uh, I will keep you posted on that. And, and I'm trying to think what else. Um, I did have some new patterns come into my life. Um, again, from Folkwear, they were actually having a sale, I think like 25% off of their patterns. Twist my arm. There were some patterns that I did want to get to go with my Edwardian walking skirts. The first pattern that I got is the Gibbs and Girl blouse which is this one. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it, but there we go. So it has, you know, it's very Edwardian. It has lace insertions, has a ruffle. There are a couple of different views for it. Uh, and then there is the armistice blouse, which again, very, very Edwardian. And these are going to go so well with my walking skirts. Oh yeah, it's, it's going to be so great. Um, and I, again, I don't generally follow popular fashions or, you know, what's in style or on trend at the moment, but at the moment, the Edwardian look is coming back. I don't know. I, I'm completely here for it. I'm so excited. It's browsing H&M and Zara and oh, twist my arm. Normally I just go into those places for the basics, but I could not resist. So I did, I did purchase some, some store-bought items that harkened back to Edwardian times. And yeah, so 
don't judge me, please don't judge me. But anyway, uh, I, I, I'm still gonna be making my own, my own garments because that, that's the whole fun of it. Am I right? Am I right? Um, but yay, new patterns, and I can't wait to dive into those. Uh, and again, these are projects that I'm working on for the history make-along that we're doing. Uh, and you know, I also, oh yes, that I totally forgot. I purchased this a while back, and for those of you into crochet that would like to partake in the make-along, highly recommend this. Um, Victorian Crochet by Weldon and Company. So if you're not familiar, Weldon's, uh, they had, I wanna say they were like a, periodical that would come out and they would have several knitting or crochet or needlework patterns in them. This is, a, I believe, a compilation of all their crochet patterns from the Victorian era. So it's just, oh, this makes my heart sing so much, guys. Uh, there was, you know, if you do want to like do a crochet granny square blanket, they have this. Um, let me see, they have some petticoats in here, of course, as well. And there's one, oh yes, yes, yes. This I might have to do at some point, but um, it's a chemise, but with a crochet lace insertion. So I might have to make this for myself at some point. Um, but definitely check that out. I will link to it below. Uh, the other thing that I do want to point out is that a lot of these patterns are available for free on the Library of Congress website. I found a whole treasure trove of both crochet and knitting patterns and sewing patterns on there, and I'll try and link to some of those below as well, but they just, the Library of Congress just scanned in all these antique, uh, you know, again, they have Weldon's and ma knitting manuals from days of yore, and they're all, they're all right there. I definitely fell down a rabbit hole of just browsing through. Um, and I am, I am feeling tempted to <laughs> tackle a, a Victorian antique knitting pattern verbatim, because if you're not familiar with those patterns, the way they're written are nothing like the way that they're written today. They're pretty much... Um, they, they pretty much assume that you already know how to knit, crochet, or whatever craft that they're talking about. So, you know, you, you have to come to it with a perspective of, you know, when they say, like, finish in the usual manner, you gotta dive into your own toolbox and figure out what the usual manner is. <laughs> but uh, I do wanna say that this book right here, she, uh, let me see, who edited this? Florence Weinstein, I have no idea who that is, but she wrote an introduction and she basically breaks down the terminologies into modern terms. So you're not left hanging. But uh, with the, the Library of Congress ones, you're probably gonna have to do your own research and figure out what those terms mean. But hopefully, if you, if you are a proficient knitter uh, or seasoned knitter or sewist or whatever, it should be pretty obvious, but um, just to give you guys a heads up about that. But hey, check that out. Okay, on to, on to life stuff. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, I reorganized my craft room. And this has kind of been an ongoing thing since I moved in, since Dennis and I moved into this house, I wanna say five years ago, which is totally good. Was it five years? I wanna say like four and a half years ago, maybe. Who knows? It's been a while since we moved in here uh, and time does fly. And I think I've reorganized the furniture in my craft room many times. I want to say about like four or five times, so to speak. Um, and I think this is the setup that actually works. It's so much more functional, so much more room and holy cow, it's total, it's a total game changer. I wanted to create kind of a photo nook for myself where I could, you know, take photos of my finished objects as opposed to just, you know, setting up a, a background, which I've been doing for the gram, for Instagram. Um, that I just wanted something where I could just set my camera up and click, point, shoot, and, and go basically. So I think this kind of accomplishes that. I don't know, I'm still working and I'm still working on it, but for the most part, I moved uh, the chaise along that was in my dye dungeon. Um, it, it was just, when I when I decorated my dye dungeon or set that up for my business, uh, I had these grand plans that I was gonna host some knit nights down there, throw some parties and <laughs> um, yeah, I, I finally realized that I'm actually an introvert and that's really not my jam. Um, even though I love going to knit nights and I, I just don't like the hosting aspect of them. <sighs> yeah, self-knowledge guys, self-knowledge is so key. So, you know, when I moved my sewing desk to the other side of the room, this wall was kind of bare and lackluster. So it just made sense for me to bring my that sofa up from the basement here and I'm so glad that I did because now not only is it a photo nook, uh, it is also my 
knit nook as well, where I can just hang out, relax, and knit, and you know, if I'm having just a long day, I can probably just recline, take a nap, or what have you. My yarn fortress is still in the same place. If I have a giant collax cubby shelf from Ikea that I keep all of my yarn and fabric in and, you know, scrap yarn. I did de-stash a whole bunch of deep stash from days of yore, just yarn that I will never get to, that I just don't have the time or energy to de-stash online. Um, I did browse Ravelry, some Ravelry groups and did find a charity in New York City that um, I could donate a whole box of yarn to and I'm so happy. Anyway, it felt good that I could unload this yarn to a charity where it's gonna be used and appreciated. Um, so yay. Uh, and of course I will link to the address or post the address down below if you would like to donate some of your own yarn to there. Um, I'm sure they can use all the yarn and crochet hooks they can get. So. Yay, allergies. Suddenly my nose is itching like crazy. <sighs> the struggle's real. I apologize for any excessive nose itching that happens in this episode. Um, but yeah, in other news, uh, Dennis and I went to the movies last weekend. We saw uh, Emma, which, and I'll be totally honest, Emma is not my favorite story uh, by Jane Austen, uh, but anyway, the costumes were just really, really beautiful. Uh, I actually, before I saw the movie, I, I got, I got Vogue magazine, uh, the da -da 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 -da, February issue. And they did an interview with the actors from there. And yeah, you got a glimpse of some of the costumes and they were so pretty. I could not resist. I had to, I, I, I was there for the costumes basically. So yeah, you get to see all the beautiful, pretty costumes. I mean, that Spencer, this is what you call a Spencer, for those not familiar. Um, it, is a, it is a Regency era coat that would go over a dress and they called it a Spencer and I am just so stinking in love with that. And also, why can't guys, why can't guys dress like this today? I mean, anyway, just completely obsessed with the costumes in this, in this movie. So anyway, even if you are not a Jane Austen fan, I definitely recommend going just for the costumes alone. They were absolutely beautiful. So uh, there is that. And then I'm trying to think what else. There is something, oh yes. Speaking of the Regency era, I should mention that uh, Zach Pinsent, uh, if you're not familiar with it, with him, he is a historical bespoke tailor. So he's based in the UK. He pretty much dresses in historical garments historically accurate garments on a daily basis, which I admire so much. He is actually, he's hosting a photo challenge over on Instagram called Modernless March. And he's prompt, you know, it's as these uh, Instagram photo challenges typically go, every day you get a different prompt and I cannot resist hopping on the bandwagon. So every day I've been challenging myself to post a photo um, based on those prompts. So, uh, you know, if you are partaking in the history mall, this might be right up your alley. He does mention that anyone is welcome to partake in the challenge, uh, you know, but I feel like it's it speaks more to people who are into historical garment making, sewing, knitting, what have you. Um, so yeah, if you are into that, definitely, definitely check it out. I've, I'm joining in and I've joined in and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, you know, and it, it also gives me a chance to kind of like up my Instagram game because normally I'm only posting my shop update stuff, finished objects. And, you know, I do want to start posting a lot more very, um, I want to start posting more variety on my Instagram feed because, you know, it's just a, a matter of finding the time and words because sometimes words just escape me and I can't word. It takes time to write captions, guys. I'm not going to lie. It's writing does not come naturally to me, but when I work on it, it's like a muscle. The more you work on something, the, the faster and more easier it comes. So I'm finding that that it's working. So <laughs> anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with that. Definitely check it out. Um, and I think, I think I will end things there. So thank you as always for hanging out with me this week. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to like and subscribe below. I put out a video, I put out an episode every Friday for your viewing pleasure. And that said, happy knitting, happy sewing, happy making, and I will see you next time.